Hello, everyone, and welcome to Traffic Corner Tuesday. My name is Paul Kerr, and I'm your host for today's webinar. Today, we'll be covering common traffic counting mistakes and, most importantly, how to avoid them. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we dive in. You can listen to today's webinar from the convenience of the audio on your PC or mobile device. There is no call in number needed. Please use the chat box on your screen to ask questions or share your experience throughout the presentation. We will be circling back to those at the end. Traffic Corner Tuesday webinar series is brought to you by Mike on Traffic, which is part of the SPAC Enterprise family of companies. SPAC Enterprise con consists of a group of traffic engineering companies focused on helping you create healthy transportation systems and fix broken ones. Also, please mark your calendars for our upcoming webinar on August 28th. We're talking about traffic circulation at school campuses just in time for kids going back to school. Today's presenters are Mike Spack and Brian Fiesick. Mike is the creative force and principal writer of the industry leading blog, Mike on Traffic. He is a licensed professional engineer, certified professional traffic operations engineer, past president of the North Central a section of the Institute of Transportation Engineers and a fellow of the Institution of Transportation Engineers. Excuse me. <clears throat> in 1996, Mike Letty over, has led over 1,000 traffic engineering projects. During the past two decades, Mike has founded several transportation related companies, including SPAC Consulting, CountingCars.com, and Traffic Data Inc. Mike will also be presenting at the ITE annual meeting on August 22nd. He hopes he'll stop by and say hello if you are attending the conference. Bryant is the Vice President of SPAC Consulting and is widely known in the transportation industry, having managed more than 1,500 traffic engineering projects. He is a licensed professional engineer, certified professional traffic operations engineer, and prides himself in being an expert in the Synchro, Sim Traffic, Vistro, and VSIM traffic model modeling software packages. Brian also, also thrives on developing creative solutions to traffic and transportation issues and enjoys writing case studies on unique projects for the Mike on Traffic blog. Please take it away, Mike and Brian. Thanks, Paul. All right, thank you, Paul. Thank you. Well, today's topic is near and dear to my heart, uh, making me feel old, but I think I did my first traffic counts about 26 years ago and uh, I've grown up in the industry and we're gonna be covering a lot of my personal mistakes today. <laughs> we like to call them lessons learned and uh, hopefully help you avoid some similar mistakes. Uh, and as Paul mentioned, for those uh, who joined a little early, feel free to pop questions into the chat box. We'll be answering questions towards the end of the webinar. Um, so if there's anything, any specific traffic counting issues you're dealing with or anything you're hoping we're going to cover today, please let us know and Paul will be mo moderating for us. Yeah, for those who have been on our webinars before, we do have our set slides that we go through, but we will stay on and answer questions longer than the time allowed. So we're happy to do that. So as I said, get those questions in and we'll do our best to answer them. So we'll start with uh, a semi shameless plug here. Uh, one of our companies is countingcars.com and uh, we sell portable traffic counting devices, and these are our three main product lines, but they really represent the majority of the data collection that traffic engineers do. Uh, first on the left is our count cam, and that's used for doing turning movement counts at intersections. Uh, in the middle is the Armadillo product, and that's a radar-based product that helps you get speed and volumes. Uh, really helpful in neighborhoods for all those fun citizen complaints. I'm sure uh, <laughs> we have city folks on the line that they get. And then lastly is our weight count, tube count device. You'll notice that uh, for those who have been around like Mike and I, we don't have a clipboard. You should not be doing those counts by hand anymore. <laughs> should use equipment, it's much more efficient, uh, lower cost, all those things. So uh, definitely look in, uh, particularly to our equipment if you don't have that yet. All right, so moving on from our, from our plug for our stuff. So first issue we have listed is just making sure you understand the physical location. So for example here, you need a count on Woodbury. Winterberry. Or sorry, Winterberry, jeez. Uh, as we look here, 
There's three different ones. If I grab my pointer. So three different ones, got a court, we have a drive up here, we have a draw. So <laughs> Wow, good find. <laughs> um, yeah, so making sure you know that physical location, which one are we at? Get the uh, get that prefix, know which know what you're looking at. And that gets back to this is a painful lesson I learned early on in my days as the traffic engineer for the city of Maple Grove. We got a kind of speed complaint uh, in a neighborhood and they requested on a similar road to Winterbury and I ended up putting the counter out on, on the avenue and it should have been on the drive. And uh, the resident was confused when they didn't see the counter out there and back and forth. And so this is a painful lesson I learned <laughs> personally. And that's particularly important when you go through multiple people so if you're setting it up and somebody else is going out to do the work, make sure you give them that full information. Yep. The second example we have on that is in this case, Metal Lark Lane. You know the, uh, you know the full name of the road in this case, but here we found it for our area in the Twin Cities. You could be in the city of Chanhassen, you could be in the city of Shakopee. Um, so yeah. besides the name, make sure you list the city too. So somebody just, these two cities happen to be close to each other, right on top of each other. Um, it could be easy to go to the wrong one. Yeah. So, and so the first one is probably more commonplace with cities or counties of making sure you have the right street. This is probably more commonplace for consultants or data collection firms that work in many yep. jurisdictions. All right, our next issue, uh, we've titled it Seasonal Impacts, but um, what we've shown here is just your typical weekday traffic over time on any particular corridor. Um, you can see we got a peak at the a.m., a little bit of a jump around noon, and then it slowly comes up to your p.m. peak. So it shouldn't be a surprise to anybody who's worked on the roads, this is your typical. And so what we talk about on seasonal impacts and a little bit more than that is just making sure you understand where you're at and is the weekday your typical for this area. So one example we have is a school pattern. So if you if you're only counting the PM peak or some minor one like that and you happen to have a school nearby, you can see for this typical school and for most that AM is the high you have a school peak and then a lower PM peak, and that's reflective of your commuter and your school AM traffic typically lines up. That leads to the jump there, but then that spreads out because school gets out earlier. Uh, some kids have after school activities. There's lots of different reasons why that goes. So if you're near that school, that's a different type of count that you need to account for. Our second example, is at a resort. So this is this would be more up north for us uh, in Minnesota. You head up to the cabin, some of those other areas. Um, again, you can see there's a little bit of that AM peak, but it really just kind of stays consistent, kind of climbs up for that PM and then starts to dive down. But in this case, it's really high almost the entire day. Yeah, so one place this comes in to think about is if you're setting out two counters, they don't work real well when cars are queued up over them, particularly if they're stopped on the tubes that blocks the air pulse from getting into the device. So understanding the traffic patterns helps you pick, do the site selection better. Uh, if you're doing capacity analysis at the intersection, you may need to put the cameras or people on the ground out for a longer duration to understand when you're getting the peak and not getting the peak. Um, those are different ways this comes into play. And another one that I'll throw out, and this is where I've been caught before, is uh, assuming that we're doing the AM and PM peak, you go through it and you're on a retail store and then they come back and say, well, wait a minute, what about the, what about the Saturday afternoon? We have a lot of traffic because it's a retail area. And then, then you have to go back and count the Saturday. So making sure you understand the area and what where those peaks truly will be so your study reflects that yeah and another example is churches 
some of the mega churches sometimes have pretty big activities on Wednesday nights. So of course you're going to study Sunday morning, but there could be that Wednesday PM peak uh, could also be an issue that needs to be studied. All right, equipment setup. So this, this gets a lot to understand in your equipment, making sure that when you're out there, you start checking it. Uh, are your settings correct? Do you have your time date set right? Has your battery been charged? Just making sure all that pre-work up front is done. Understanding your equipment, understanding what you're putting out, and making sure it's working. And this could go Unfortunately, we've had cases where we've gone out and we flipped it on, everything looks good, and for some reason they hit a button and turned it off when they left. Yep. So making sure your equipment is still running when you leave. So all those things with the equipment set up, really understand what you're, what you're putting out there, how to make it work, how to keep it going through your account. Yep, we pride ourselves in having good manuals, good videos for all of our products and some more generic, here's how to install tubes. So check out our YouTube channel for all those kinds of things. But I mean, it's, I experienced this as an intern eons ago of, hey Mike, you're our new traffic counting guy and we need you to set up these tubes tomorrow. Well, how do I do that? I don't know, figure it out. <laughs> that's, yep. not, that's not the best <laughs> answer. So try to have the resources, try to have Make sure your gear is working properly and the people yeah, the, doing the, the install. The worst thing in the world is going out and getting that equipment and then realizing it didn't collect anything. And that's, yep. th that's an awful feeling when you get out there. Yep. And next one, this is a little bit different than making sure you're on Winterberry Lane or Drive or in the right city, but the equipment location and if we bring the pointer, this is over by our office and this is just a, we've done traffic counting <laughs> around this area, but uh, this is a nightmare if you had to put a tube counter out here. Um, tube counters generally are not accurate across a four lane undivided road. There's just too many air pulses and all the manufacturers say that <laughs> in their literature yep. that you should have tube counters just going across two lanes. You don't want to set them out where there's parked vehicles that uh, we've had it happen. Somebody parks on the tube, blocking the air pulse getting into the tube counter. So in this kind of scenario, if the tube counter was chained off to this light pole over here and what I'll call the plugged end, the dumb end of the tube, somebody parks on that, that doesn't affect the accuracy of the count because that air pulse is getting back into the device. But if that device was chained up over here on this light pole and somebody was parked on the tube, that just blocks the air pulse. So that's yep. being aware of the surroundings. Also, I said a little bit earlier that two counters are not accurate with very slow moving traffic or cues building up over the cars or cars turning over them, kind of making their turn over the tubes. They're you want those wheels to hit them at the same time. So if they're turning, you're almost going to get four hits on the tube, yes. one for each tire. And that could be counted as two vehicles. And what does that mean? Or it could be counted as a large truck when it was just a car that went over. So, so it can play so, havoc on your count. So this is a tough spot. If you were supposed to get a 48 hour count on this stretch of road, <laughs> you have driveway, driveway, street, driveway, driveway, off the skewed road, street, on street parking. Mm -hmm. This is one where if you need accurate data, we would say put a camera out there, a non intrusive device, a radar device out there that can overcome the turning vehicles and the slow moving traffic. So a couple other things we'll mention more specific to Cameras, if you're putting them out there, you need to pay attention to which way the camera is facing. So ideally you want to get it facing north or south, avoid east-west facing cameras for sunrise, sunsets. Yep. Yeah, all that cameras. Sun glare. Yeah, all cameras. Some cameras it'll turn, it'll just white out the whole screen if it's direct sun right into the iris of the camera. But even best case scenario, you're still going to get some glares that make it harder to get the traffic data out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, and the other one is just to be aware of your surroundings as well. Um, and I'd say in particular, if you're in a heavy pedestrian area, and I'll go further and say if you are in a younger pedestrian area, high schoolers, college, uh, be aware that vandalism does happen. You might want to set up a backup in particular cases, just in case somebody does something to it. We've had it happen before. Yeah. People will walk right up to the camera and pull some, sorry, try to do something to it, <laughs> to re, reposition it, pull a cable, yeah. whatever they want. Yeah, back in my Maple Grove days, I had uh, a set of tubes neatly undone and tied in a bow on the side of the street. Clearly a <laughs> resident right. didn't like that. <laughs> I also had one out on a gravel road in a very rural area of town that was shot by a gun, um, little target practice action. So it, yep. uh, it, stuff like that happens. Um, so be aware of that and try to have redundancy. Another thing I wanna bring up that actually really upsets me, but Haley, who has shown a couple slides back, had an issue come up and thankfully we have a culture where she was comfortable bringing this up. Um, it's happened a couple times to her that she kind of has been people, guys driving slowly by her. Um, but in an industrial park, she had a semi truck driver stop, say some pretty inappropriate comments and then watch her do a setup. And our answer to that immediately was, no traffic count is worth any risk to yeah. safety. And we encouraged, we told her flat out, leave, leave lock up, call 911 if you feel in immediate danger, go back, do whatever you need to do to stay safe. Um, so that comes back to protocol. You want people trained to work safely in the road, look both ways before they move their feet, wear the appropriate safety vest. But this yeah. is a new level of we didn't anticipate this as middle-aged guys that Haley encountered this. So there are some areas in our region that now we kind of defensively send different people to. Or we'll send two. I mean, and that's again, being aware of your surroundings. Is this an area where there could be high crime, something like that? You may want two people out there just again, from that safety factor. So and counting cars is not worth somebody's safety. Just keep that in mind. Okay, so data management, this comes to, once you bring the information back, how are you downloading it? How are you setting it to where it needs to be? How are you making sure it gets off the equipment and into your project folder or whatever it needs to be? So this can be, this can be tricky. Um, it's happened before where we brought equipment in, in the past we brought equipment in and before somebody grabbed it and downloaded it, somebody else took the counter back out and yeah. copied over it. We lost some counts that way. So it's, it's very important to have that process of when the, when the equipment comes in, what happens from there? Yeah, well, how does the data get into your computer system? Where is it stored? How is it saved? So it's clear where the location was, all of that stuff. Um, little pat on the back. We've tried to solve a lot of these issues with our weight count tube counter. Yep. Uh, we're the only device out there that has, we basically cut the download cable that the intention is you're out in the field and as you're retrieving the tubes, you, it's all phone based and app based. So you just hit upload the data and it shoots it into the cloud based storage system that's free. And then the engineers later can pull that data off whenever they want and as often as they want. So uh, as all of the manufacturers are bringing our technology into the 21st century, this should become less and less of an issue, um, but it's still something to be aware of. <laughs> and uh, another one, this is Jonah in the office. Uh, Freshly minted PE passed his mm -hmm. engineering exam. So congratulations, Jonah. But uh, he is uh, a recovering circus guy. Uh, he still teaches <laughs> circus classes. He took a year off to do high wire uh, while he was in college. And so we snapped a photo of him juggling some weight counts. But uh, this gets back to Brian talking about 
pulling equipment out before it was downloaded, um, just making sure you have all of your gear inventoried, it's in working order, knowing what you have, so that when you need to do the counts, you have the gear ready for it and you can make sure yep. you can get done what you need to get done. And I would say this, this tags on to the data management. So after you get your counts off, the equipment's ready to go again. Now you need to take it back in. Do you need to recharge it? Uh, for some of the cameras, you will need to recharge. Make sure it's fully charged before it goes back out. Uh, for our weight counts, the way we've got it, we have software to make sure everything hooks up and links. Do you have the latest software? Yeah. So making sure that you are using the most recent version of the whatever you're using. And, yeah. And yeah. That, in our case, the phone app and the, the firmware that goes with it. In other cases, it might be the software on the computer and how you Yeah. With other manufacturers, it. you have to go out to their website and do the manual updates and pull it. But make sure yep. your equipment is all up to date and current. Yep. And then this is also the point where we would pull the set of equipment out, whatever it might be, if something has happened that we need to investigate later. Don't just put it in the mix and think, you know, oh, it just happened once, it'll be fine. Do some investigation, is something wrong with your counter, is something wrong with your tubes, whatever it might be, yeah, just if something happens, be sure to investigate it before you send it back out there. Yeah, the little nozzles coming out of all tube counters are, those are very sensitive devices inside there and some pebbles or sand can get in there and yep. wreak havoc on that accuracy and how those operate. And so it's- Your tubes can get cuts in them and then the air pulse doesn't fully get yep. to the counter. There's yeah. lots of little things to check and just making sure your equipment isn't good condition, ready to go before you send it back out there. Yep. And uh, this is, uh, we alluded to this a little bit with making sure your personnel are comfortable sending two people out and either on busier roads or slightly less than ideal conditions uh, instead of just one person, making sure they have all the up-to-date training. Um, one thing I find very important because thankfully it's never happened, but it, I can't imagine living through it. It has happened. Field techs have been hit by cars and there have been a couple of fatalities in the last 50 years. So I was taught early in my career, your head moves both ways before your feet move. And I just, no count, no traffic count is worth any risk to safety. So just make sure your personnel are well-trained and understand the risks here and we have to assume that with distracted driving being worse than ever that we cannot count on the drivers paying attention or even seeing us out yep. in the field yep. we have to be fully responsible yep so making sure you have all the personal safety equipment that you need the vests um, you're well lit you're doing it during the day we don't recommend going out at night if you can avoid it yep. um, Making sure your car that you're using can you, you know, has flashers, whatever it might be, but then also making sure everyone knows how to use the equipment. So we have YouTube videos for our equipment. We have manuals. Give them time to review that, to understand it. You can use tests. You can have ride-alongs. There's other ways just to make sure not only are they safe, but they know how to use it before they, you send them out yeah. there. Yeah, and this again comes back to my experience as an intern being thrown a bucket of equipment and say, go, go do this tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, not the ideal way. No. So we'll go through a couple, we have three different tactics here for addressing some of these issues that come up. So kind of a lot of this boils down to a book that had a profound impact on me called The Checklist Manifesto by Dr. Atul Gawande. Uh, very uh, great writer, he's done a lot of great work, but basically brings the same thought process to the checklists of being a airplane pilot mm -hmm. into how they brought that into surgical, into surgery rooms and into hospitals and if checklists help improve safety and performance of surgeons and pilots, I think it's good enough for us as engineers and data collectors. So we're big on setting up checklists and making sure you're going through the proper steps every time. Uh, 
And this goes back all the way to me going out early when we started Traffic Dead Inc. and I was working nights and weekends and I drove out to a site 45 minutes away at night at six o'clock to set up some tube counters and I didn't bring enough gear with me <laughs> and my wife, my wife Jane packed up our newborn Maria and brought me some tube counters, but it was a colossal mess. Um, so <laughs> have a checklist, yep. make sure yep. you have all of the gear um, and make sure your work vehicle is well stocked. Yeah. In our example here, you don't have to pay attention to the actual stuff. It's just, it's again, it's just a checklist for whatever you need. Not only the equipment, uh, safety equipment, do you know the locations, how much you need of whatever it is you're going out, cameras, uh, tube counts, tubes, whatever it might be. So the second one we do, and we set this up for every count we do, whether it's a camera or a tube, whatever it is, uh, we have a sheet that we set up. Again, the specifics of this one, you don't have to get into it, but we list out the code that we have, which matches our project number, the specific name and city, full name with the, with the suffixes, the avenue streets on there, where it is, what you're recording. Then we, you know, we've got places for who's going out there, when they're going out there. We have a map so that people can match it up. It's very easy to do a screen clip from Google or whatever your favorite mapping one is. And then at the bottom, if it's an engineering study on this one, we list things we want them to confirm. So for our studies, we also want them to look around. Is the map we're seeing online uh, consistent with what's out there or has anything changed? Yep. So they're taking lots of notes on the physical infrastructure. And again, lesson learned, we did a whole, I did a whole study early in my career that Thankfully, when we got out there, recognized, hey, they built a new intersection <laughs> yeah. that was not included in the scope of the study. And like, oh, we better add that in. So things can be different out in the field and make sure you have good documentation and also good diagrams of where you set out the equipment in case the person picking up the gear was not the person who set it up. Even yep. if you intend it to be the same person, maybe that person got sick or something and somebody else has to yeah, we'll do that same thing on this sheet. We'll just mark right on the map. But if it's a camera, we'll mark what sign or street post it's on, where, which way it's pointed, that sort of thing. Okay. And then last technique is finally when you get the data in, make sure it makes sense. Look over. Uh, make sure that there are the AM and PM peak hours line up when you think they will. You, the clock could be off in the device. Um, if you have intersections next to each other, make sure the volumes leaving one intersection are about the same amount of volumes arriving at the next. If yep. you're putting out tube counters and also doing turning movement counts, make sure the PM peak is about 10% of the overall daily traffic, which is kind of a rule of thumb. So just be thoughtful and check through the data. Um, so we're running out of time here, a couple minutes left. We have put together all of these thoughts in a traffic counting manual, covers all of our best practices, has different kinds of checklists for, for you to use as a starting point. And uh, we just typically, we offer that on spacacademy.com uh, for $79, but we're marking it down to 39, we're cutting it in half for the month. And today only, we're gonna knock it down $19 if this seems like something you could use. There's a lot of good material in there. Um, it's used in about a dozen universities in their traffic engineering program. We're proud of this manual. Um, encourage you to pick that up. It comes with some different docs, templates mm -hmm. you can use. Um, so to rifle through the end of the program, uh, join us at the end of next month. We'll be talking about schools right before school starts. And uh, now we'll open it up to questions if Paul wants to come over with the chat. And, uh... Yes, so we had quite a few. We have quite a few questions revolving around the tubes. So I'm going to jump around to try and get some order to some of them. So if I don't go to yep. in order of the questions, please understand that. Yep, and uh, it's one o'clock. So feel free to jump off. We're just going to be doing the Q&A and we'll stay with you as, to get through all the questions. So uh, Sharon asks, what tube layout do you recommend for four lane undivided roadways for speed and classification studies? 
one counter with two tubes for one direction and a second counter with two tubes for the other direction. How do you go about that? Yeah, that's exactly how we would do it. We'd try to put one on each side, just yep. grab two lanes only. Yep. And, and, then, and then anchor them in the middle of the road, which is not where you want to be working. So that if you have to do that, we recommend a two person crew yep. and try to one make to sure. One to set up, one to watch for traffic. Yep, and but typically in our region, traffic ebbs at the kind of lowest point, kind of 10 to 11 a.m is mm -hmm. kind of our sweet spot for the least amount of traffic. So those kinds of setups we try to work in at that time of day. Don't leave them till 3.30 in the afternoon <laughs> where, yeah. you, where you're playing Frogger for all of us uh, of my vintage. <laughs> and I, I am gonna break in again, it is one o'clock. So thanks to everybody who showed up. We hope you got some good information out this. We encourage you to go to the site, check out our counting manual. We hope we see you again in a month. And for those who, again, want to hang with us, we will get to all these questions, but just wanted for those who needed to leave, you know, thanks again for, for joining us. And like yep. I said, hope to see you next month. And then also covered Zach's question as well. So Nick had a question. When placing tubes on busy streets with a range from uh, 10,000 to 15,000 ADT, is it recommended to place tubes in the early a.m. before the peak, like before <laughs> 7 a.m. or between 9 and 11 a.m.? So, well, we just covered that. Yeah. Our, mm -hmm. our preferred sweet spot is after the morning rush hour. Yeah. Um, uh, if you really need to get out there before the morning rush hour, if you have daylight, we, we don't <laughs> want to work in dark conditions, and we want to pick the lightest traffic conditions. I'm going to do two kind of back to back here. Uh, Sandy says if uh, or asks if tubes are not good for obtaining data for four lane highways, how would you recommend speed data collection for a four lane highway? Radar. Yeah, a radar device. Uh, we sell the Armadillo, which works, which covers up to two lanes. Um, there are big, expensive trailer mounted. Um, different devices. There's half a dozen different manufacturers in the radar uh, device arena. Um, and it also depends on what you need it for. If you just need a quick snapshot, just a few sample ones, there are hand devices that you can get pretty cheap. You can send somebody out there on an yeah. overpass or something just to nab a few and get a sample size that way as well. Yeah, and that's typically good enough for engineering analysis we're doing. Um, and we used to sell a device called the Pocket Radar, um, but Amazon is crushing us on price and convenience. So we <laughs> decided just to let them sell it. So uh, if that's of interest, you can get a little handheld, very accurate radar gun for about $200. So uh, I encourage you to pick one of those up. Also fun for clocking the kids' fastballs. And that leads into the follow-up, which is Ian asks, have you done any studies comparing the accuracy of two counters versus the radars? Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, generally, uh, the radar is much more accurate than tubes. Uh, tubes are kind of an order of magnitude. That, yeah. um, and most tube counters are close to spot on within a mile per hour or two for each vehicle when traffic is light. The issue is on real heavy traffic conditions with those air pulses, uh, that's tough for the algorithms to split out. And, Depending on how many lanes you're trying to get. Yeah. I mean, if, you, so, if you're so, only doing a single lane, you're obviously gonna have more accuracy. Yep. So that way, if you have two, two directions, those cars can overlap. That can throw a bit of uncertainty into the tubes. Yeah. So, so my assumption is tube counters are generally accurate to kind of one to two miles per hour. Um, yeah. If you need it to the decimal point, for whatever you're doing, uh, a radar device is the yeah, best Yeah, and I, you know. I think that's just understanding what you need on that. Are you trying to set speed limits where you need a large aggregate of data, or do you just need spot checks to understand what's going on? Getting into non-intrusive um, ways of counting, is there any software that can extract data axle-wise classifications from a video? Not, not that we're not aware that we of. Know of. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's one of the holy grails of the industry. And as far as we know, it doesn't exist. Uh, Jai wants to know how to get the manual list today. Where do they go? I uh, go to 
bit.ly, so bit.ly forward slash count manual. Okay. Um, and that will take you, if, if that doesn't get you there, go to spacacademy.org.com. Dot com. Spacacademy.com and you can find it, uh, you can dig around and find the traffic counting manual. Um, Mike, what is the counting cars based count price and how different is the price between you guys and MyoVision? Uh, MyoVision, so our products are work similar to MyoVision. Our camera systems are about $1,500 and theirs are about $4,500. Um, we've taken a different approach on the hardware that we are much smaller and more discreet and phone app based. So instead of having a monitor built into the device and needing big poles and stuff, you just pull it up on your phone to be able to program and see it, et cetera. Uh, and then we do have our account cloud service, which is the data processing. And uh, our clients tell us we're, a, we, we're about a third cheaper. Um, if you were a mega user of MyoVision, sending them millions of hours of video, they would be cheaper than us. They certainly discount their prices deep for those type of power users. But for the normal consulting firm doing a few thousand hours a year, we are a third to half the price of MyoVision's pricing. So, and, and finally, is there a way they can get a, 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 this presentation in the future? Yeah, this will we'll be emailing out the video and we post all of our Traffic Corner Tuesdays on our YouTube channel. So look for that. Uh, you should be able to find us just Googling it, but you'll be getting an email uh, automated out from the sent from the zoom should system be, yeah. that you registered with. You should be getting an email here today with the recorded video. You can please feel free, watch again, share it with colleagues, all those kinds of things. Um, make it go viral, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> That's all we have over here on this end, guys. So Okay. Thanks, Paul. And uh, thanks, everyone, for staying with us. Uh, this is a lot of fun. And uh, near and dear, please email us with questions. We are, we've been doing this for a long time and have a lot of thoughts on traffic counting and uh, are here to help uh, you do better data collection. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you.